the background is very simple. Um, I um, submitted a 10 minutes talk and was extended to 30 minutes. And so I asked still if he uh, would be um, participate. And from the first stage, he said, yeah, that sounds interesting. And after realizing what will happen here, uh, he get abstained from this. And that's why I'm staying here alone. But uh, you can catch him here and ask him what he is doing and for which company he is working, something like this. Uh, he's a student. Um, and um, in, the, uh, in this case, he is uh, responsible for documentation, the progress, the networking people in the company is make, making so that somebody else, for instance, a manager, understands what the networking people are doing. Um, that's the main point. Uh, what Till is uh, doing here. And one of the issues he had to uh, handle was quality of service. He had to describe it in a way that other people, which are not technically addicted, will understand it. On the other hand, quality of service is something technical people do not understand and do not want to talk about, do not want to know about. Um, for the purpose of this talk, um, I will refer to a lot of different equipments. Uh, these are the equipment we are currently have in the networking. We are trying to replace Cisco uh, equipment by uh, other technologies or newer technologies <coughs> because we are going to uh, 100, megabit, uh, 100 gigabit in the, in the, in the core and Cisco will become too expensive for this. Um, on the other hand, the Cisco devices are end of everything for about five to 12 years. <clears throat> so it's time to replace them. Um, what we are doing is we are doing the replacement in the running network. That means that we have very long time frames for changing something, uh, especially because we do not have uh, feature equivalents. We had to uh, find ways to provide a similar functionality of a different way and have to make a transition uh, while all customers are online. So that takes time and will take more time next years. <coughs> Quas. Why we are talking about Quas or why somebody is talking about Quas is simple because we have a device which has more incoming bandwidth than outgoing bandwidth. That may mean that the device has more incoming devices than the packets are going out to other devices. So it has to decide which packets, if they are coming at the same time, going out first. Um, the device had to make a lot of decisions. Uh, if such a collision is happening, what, what to do if a packet arrives which is more important than another, or who defines what is more important than another. Uh, so um, if the decision goes wrong, or if the decision um, the device is taking will cause an, uh, an, an unintended uh, result. Uh, you get all the things you know from the postal services. Packets will arrive between early in the morning or late in the afternoon. You have to stay there all the day. Or the packets will do not, will do not arrive at all, and you do not uh, know why. And several applications are not very happy with this. Others are a bit more tolerant. Um, that's the technical point. There's a management point on the problem space. If you are doing quos and avoid these problems, um, there is no need to expand your network until it's too late. So uh, in a lot of networks, the quos uh, is rolled out in a way that it does not work effectively. Um, it's done in a way that you can say, yeah, we are doing cross, we're marking traffic or doing anything else, uh, but we never, never do anything on the wire. 
So if we get a cognition and we have a problem in the network, we can go to the management and say we have to expand our network, we have to uh, uh, acquire new lines, new, uh, new router or something else if you're doing, wasn't doing it well. It will postpone these de uh, decisions up to a, a time where there is no router available, uh, no, uh, it will take months to get a new line and you're lost. So a lot of uh, network engineers go, uh, going down and saying, yeah, we are doing cross, doing cross and ignoring anything. And if something is happening, the network going and replace it with faster hardware. So in principle, we have two solutions uh, for this uh, problem space. The first one is very simple, avoid all the problems. That's what telcos are doing. That was OTN, or what the uh, optical transfer networks are doing. They simply reverse a uh, reserve for every possible packet or frame, a time slot, and the uh, interface where it will go out. So we have a complete parity. You book a bandwidth through the whole network beforehand, <clears throat> and if you do so, you do not have a problem because there is no bandwidth mismatch. There is no uh, decision necessary to uh, go and say we have to decide which packets go first. Um, of course it doesn't work in the internet. If you go to your customer and say oh, you want to uh, look <coughs> for uh, a video stream on YouTube, uh, please reserve this two days before and we, get, we will get a time slot uh, you can look this video at 7, 7.30 Bandwidth is reserved. <clears throat> I don't think that uh, internet is working this way. So what we can do in in course is we have we can take the decisions the devices are doing. The devices are doing these decisions any time. You can't stop them because packets arrive. The only thing you can do is you can manage this. So if you say, we are not doing cross, because it's too complicated, it has uh, any benefit, you are doing cross, you're taking defaults. It might be useful default, it might be very bad defaults. So what I'm trying to do in this talk here is to guide you through the design process of cross and to the implementation process of cross for different platforms, they will see that there are different approaches for the hardware. Uh, the takeaway for you, in best case, is that you say, oh, it's not that complicated. Uh, it might be a lot of configuration, it might be a lot of reading, but uh, at least I have a faint view where to start and uh, where to go and which are the important points there. So let's start. <coughs> Quas is a local decision on each device. You have to classify traffic. You have to go and say which, what, what's important. And um, if you are doing so on a larger network and you have the decision on each, uh, to make on each device, you have the problem that you have to know everything on your network on each device. That will be complex. And that's why. Uh, people love to marking tra uh, traffic on the edge. Going on the edge saying, oh, I know what it is. The customer has the following um, requirements or the service which has the following uh, requirements to the network. So I make a special mark and if, if I can you reuse this mark at any time. Uh, so the others only had to recognize the mark and do not, know, uh, do not have to make the decision where it's coming from, who is, uh, which is going to Anytime. <clears throat> and we have a lot of possibilities. The first possibility is the DSCP. It's field in IP, in IPv4 and IPv6. Um, with a lot of possibilities. Forget anything you know about EF uh, or any marks in this case. Uh, they are completely irrelevant. They uh, had go out of production for 20, 25 years. Um, 
it's an opaque field. You have uh, 64 bit, uh, 64 values you can define in your uh, own way. Of course, there are some common values which are defined by your external customers or your external uh, equipment, and you, it's easier to keep them. If you all, if you redesign this, uh, it's easier to keep them. The same goes for the three bits in the Ethernet header. If you are doing 802.1p, it's the other part of PQ. Uh, Q is for tagging, and P is for taking the reserve bit in Q for marking. Um, there we have eight possibilities, and the problem is that it's not persistent. It will be removed on the next router, which will remove the Ethernet header and replace it by another one. <coughs> and of course, if you have other transport mechanisms like MPLS, you have some bits there. For our network, we are uh, transporting data for third party customers and they get very upset if we modify their packets. <laughs> so we are not able to set the DSCP value in the packet which comes from the customer. <laughs> um, we make a VXLAN transport for several services so we might use the DSCP packet, uh, packet in, the, in the VXLAN header. We might have tech traffic from the customer where we are not allowed to change the cost bits. Uh, so the only remaining <laughs> field we can use for, uh, in our uh, network is the cost bit on the wire, the, out, uh, the outer scope. Um, so that means we have to use tech traffic on the interconnection. So. And then, that's the point where it becomes interesting, uh, you have to make a model. You have to decide which traffic classes, which services you want to provide in your network. And if you are restricted to eight, you have to classify and you have to follow some constraints. The red, uh, <coughs> red numbers are hard to change, so don't try to do this. Um, device management network control coming from the devices itself, sometimes is really a problem to change them. A normal internet is set to zero. That's common for a lot of devices, so do not try to change it. <clears throat> In our case, uh, we uh, want to provide background traffic, so we have a class beh uh, behind the normal internet, um, for instance for backups or uh, something like this that we can uh, transport if there is some free space on the, on the wire. And we have so party traffic um, and they require several classifications too. We had uh, some problems with German Telecom which insists that they don't want to have four classifications um, Now they have four classifications because we are able to map their normal internet into our class zero. Um, that's contractual compliant. Um, the other point is if uh, a packet's arriving, they can be, and, and there is something on the, uh, on the network, and some packets are waiting on the outgoing interface, you can go and say, add to the queue tail or bypass the queue. Priority means bypass. <laughs> Round robin means we have multiple queues like in, uh, in the supermarket and we take one from each in round robin manner. If we're uh, talking about band visit, it means we take one from, uh, in this case, we take one from Q3, we take one from Q2, and we take four from Q1 uh, and start over. And if somebody has some spare time, uh, may have a look at Q0. That means that we have an effective bandwidth for this round robin pace, uh, part which says that uh, 
through is, uh, two qu uh, thirds of the traffic are our normal internet and that perfectly match our traffic um, in the network too. So it's, uh, it's a good model. <laughs> After modeling, you have to go and put it into the devices. <laughs> In most cases, it's very simple because you can't, modify, uh, you can't model it or you can't codify it. Only on Drupal, uh, Juniper you are going there and define your code, code points and say, we have some names for this. It makes the configuration more easy to read. If you don't do this, you get some default names and you will not be lucky with it. So uh, please do. Define your code points. Next is, we have forwarding classes, traffic classes or something. The eight month we had on the, um, uh, on the table there. And on Juniper, we have to name them. If we don't do, we get default names, which are not appropriate. So we name them. And of course, we take the same uh, values that we had defined in the table ourselves. <coughs> Um, priority low, prior, um, yeah, we, we come to this um, later on. <coughs> First thing to classify is host generated traffic on the device. Most people are not aware that the device itself generates traffic, <coughs> but um, it's really important to do so, otherwise you get struck with the uh, classification the device doing anyway. So if you have a routing daemon on a device, it might use COSPIT 6. It might go to traffic class 6, which is fine because it's our network class. That's why it's our networking class. And if you are going to make manage, uh, access to the management network and inbound, you get class 7 management. That's fine that we have this, because we have defined it in this way. Um, on the other hand, if you want to do it our, uh, yourself on Juniper, you can do this. It's uh, mainly here that you see you can do this, and you can do it in an interesting way. For instance, for ICMP, we are using a high loss priority, so it doesn't matter if the packets are dropped in the case that we have a cognition they are more likely to be dropped than others. Um, okay. Then we have to classify incoming traffic from outside. We, something is coming into the network. Uh, on the main reason why we are introducing this is that we had an unicast uh, IPTV provider which insists on QOS. Mm. No, I don't go into this decision deeper. <clears throat> um, so we have to classify it. Everything coming from uh, this uh, source is our class real time and has to be uh, classified this way. It's very simple, simply say everything coming in this interface is this class. <clears throat> Otherwise, um, you have to go to the, uh, the code points. Uh, I think that it will work this way. Uh, there should be a laser pointer. There is none. Okay. What's infrared for high speed? One thousand three hundred nanometer. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, for trust, we uh, simply use the code points we found on the on the wire. These are the, the, the points on the, on the right side, the code points, which we have defined. And we uh, say, if you see this on an interface, then please put the traffic in the, uh, in the forwarding class and use the uh, uh, loss priority we have defined for this. <coughs> on Arista, um, we, um, we do not do it per network. We do not do it on IP addresses. We have VLANs, where special services um, 
are provided and we are classifying on wheel, based on VLAN. Uh, it's it, it, something a bit easier for us. Of course, you can do a match on IP address lists uh, or the access list or something. This in each of these cases, you need TCAM feature for this. <coughs> So, in the simple case, we have a classification based on VLANs. So we say, if you have a VLAN on on wire, then we say, uh, put the, the traffic in the, uh, uh, in the matching traffic class. Or for trust, uh, trust, it's simple, easy. We are going hit and say, if you see a cost field, trust it. Um, sorry, if you see a cost field, you trust it. Uh, trust in which way? Let's go back. The cost bit doesn't match the class we are using. How can we trust this? If we see a cost bit zero, will it be class zero? Okay. Arista is using a cost to traffic class map. The default map is this way. So it matches our requirements. That's the reason why, because it matches, that we define the traffic classes beforehand. <coughs> but you can do it differently on uh, per interface. You can say, I will use a different map. For instance, here for DTAC, as I said, we have exactly this problem that uh, they require four classes and we can only provide three. So we map all the traffic which is not or explicitly not guaranteed with anything in the contract to class zero. In our case, it's don't care. Um, Okay, classifying, incoming traffic. We have a cost bit, we can look at the cost bit, we trust it, we map it to a, cl a traffic class. Same for Cisco. <laughs> Cisco is using a DSCP-like classification internally. So you can say you have a DSCP a virtual DSCP uh, value for each packet, which is on the uh, on uh, in the fabric, um, but the classification on the switches is not made this way. You can't classify packet uh, traffic on incoming. It becomes a little bit complicated in this way. <coughs> the only thing you can do is if you have unclassifiable traffic, for instance, traffic coming from outside and you want to put it in a special way and say that should be come in as if the cost bit was set too. Then you can use the approach uh, below saying for uh, VLAN bop, bop, bop on the trunk, please set the cost bit to six. Um, it's a double definition. First, it really sets the cost bit to six on the incoming frame, which the header is dropped. And, of course, on the outgoing frame. <coughs> it's the same. On the RSR, we have um, the same problem. We have an internal classification. It's called cross group. And we can uh, use it to make an explicit translation. If you see a cost bit 7 on the um, on the wire, then put it in the cost group. Of course, we take the same numbers, otherwise it would be crazy. That's incoming classification. We have packets on the wire, we have classified them coming from the host, coming from a special interface, coming from special VLAN, or coming from interconnection back in trust. Marking. On the edge, this was easy because we know the, the source, and now we want to mark it in a way that it goes to the next device. So, in the, in the connection, we want to put the same information going outside, the next one can use it as internal classification. <coughs> it goes the same way. For each forwarding class, for each traffic class, you have to define for which 
loss priority you want to use which code point on the wire. That's a very, very lengthy definition. I only to, uh, used it here, here for a single class. We have eight classes, we could have more, uh, and use the rewrite for this. <coughs> Because we have several VLANs there, so we have unit star and, uh, and wildcard to going out. The important point here is that you notice if we have a high loss priority, we can downgrade the traffic. So the next, next device can use the information and say, okay, this was traffic which had be dropped had nearly be dropped beforehand, so if I have a pressure on line, I can drop it now. Uh, it should not have been here on this device. <clears throat> That's a classification you can't do by reclassification on each device because you didn't know what the state on another uh, router uh, was. It's a it might be a dynamic uh, a reclassification and it makes your network something more interesting for you and harder to understand for your colleagues. On Arista, you can't do this, uh, at least for our devices. We can't put, we can't rewrite the cost bit because the command does not exist. It's not available. It's not available because it's always on despite the documentation says otherwise. Doesn't matter. <clears throat> uh, so, even if the command does not exist, it works. <laughs> and on, the only thing you have to do is to inverse the classifying step. You're defining a map and saying, if we have the following class, please set out the following bits. Uh, more or less straightforward. On Cisco, <coughs> I said we are not able to make a classification on the switches. So the only point where you can set the outgoing cost uh, values is on incoming policy. The packet arriving on an interface will be classified in a way that you say, for this packet you are using the outgoing cost bit in the following way, regardless which interface I will choose later. That means if you are using these devices, you run into the problem that you have to use all the, on, uh, on all the interfaces the same cost bits. And it doesn't mean that they have to trust it. You have to set it in any time. And if you want to use the same cost bits come in, incoming outgoing, you have to clearly set, set cost cost. Set the cost bit, by taking the cost bit value. <coughs> okay. For RSL, the same, <coughs> you can use it straightforward, uh, naming it cost group instead of traffic class. Now for the interesting point, <coughs> hardware. Outgoing hardware have different number of queues. You have interface which is two queues, you have one queue, you have eight queues, most common cases eight queues. Um, that's why most devices have only eight traffic classes, because they map one to one. If you have more than eight traffic classes defined, you need to provide a mapping which uh, traffic class you uh, want, uh, which forwarding class, uh, which outgoing queue you want to use. <clears throat> if you're mapping traffic to the outgoing queue, you will notice that you have three possibilities. You can policy traffic, can go and say, this customer does not, is not allowed to have more than 200 megabits. Might be. Uh, you can shape traffic and saying, I do not want to use more than, and if delay traffic. But for our network, it doesn't care. We do not use any policing. Uh, we use scheduling because we want to use the whole, uh, full band bandwidth for everybody, if possible. So scheduling is distributing the available bandwidth and policing is making contractual uh, compliance. 
And then there are drop profiles. We had a, heard a lot of cross um, uh, loss priority or uh, drop uh, priority, and you uh, can really define how a packet will be dropped. The typical drop profile you find in most devices linear. If you have a zero length queue, no, no packet is waiting on this, you have a zero probability that the packet will be lost because it will be sent out. If the queue is full, it will be 100% uh, loss priority because there is no room to add a packet to the queue. In all other cases, the probability to drop the packet will increase if the um, queue is longer. Um, you can modify this profile. I did it for <coughs> Juniper in aggressive moderate and uh, um, easy way. So for the easy way is up to 80% uh, on the on the queue. <coughs> you will no loss at all, and then it will sharply uh, go up to 100%. 100% is default on <coughs> on the, the last, and zero zero is the default on the other side. And you can make a nice graph how to drop packets on which level of queuing. The same is possible for Cisco. Uh, we do not use it there. <coughs> and for Arista, it's not that easy because uh, they, they do not like to drop packets. Uh, they prefer to uh, make a warning be uh, beforehand. And we do not use this configuration at the moment. But that's the, the point where you can start reading if you want to do this. Hardware use. <coughs> I have two minutes uh, from the start. <clears throat> it looks pretty complicated. It's not. It simply says, if we have, we define a scheduler, how to put packets on the queue. How many packets will be used in a, a special priority way? So bypass the queue, but then we stop and say 10% of the queue is used by this uh, traffic. We stop here. There's no priority queue at, uh, for a while, and we will take everything else. I urgently recommend to have a bandwidth limit for priority queues for everybody. Otherwise, you will starve any other traffic. <coughs> Managing queues for Arista is in the same way. You define which queue get which bandwidth and where is the priority break. <coughs> um, you can see that below uh, the round robin definition is on queue three, and everything else, we are, uh, our lower classes are, will, will be round robin. It doesn't, doesn't make sense if you have a round robin and then we go back to a priority. It doesn't make sense. And the brand width will be get calculated in a new way. We have some different values here because uh, 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 device in different situation. So, so looks good. But if you come to a device which have only two queues, you get the following result up there. We have a traffic class to traffic queue uh, to, to transmit queue mapping. And now the question, can, can anybody say how traffic class zero, uh, traffic class one, which our normal industrial traffic, how much bandwidth will it have on this interface? Traffic class one is mapped to Q zero, the table below, uh, in, in, in the middle. And we have 9% of the bandwidth for our normal internet. That's not the way we are expecting. So uh, it's very simple. We simply use other, uh, a, a new definition and say we only have two classes and make them uh, 10 to 90%. But it doesn't work this way. That's not the only point. There's another queuing mechanism from the central routing and uh, switching device to the interfaces. 
It's bottle output queuing. And if you're looking there, we have eight. So we have to use the same definition for a two and an eight queuing mechanism. Yeah, I know. Um, on Cisco, um, yeah, don't do it on the uh, 4,500. You will get brain dead. <laughs> on the RSR, it's more like Juniper, doesn't make any uh, problem. And in order to find out what will go wrong, you have some commands. You can look at the uh, devices and see what's happening. There are two commands which do not seem very appropriate here. That one is show hardware countertop. That will show you the drops from the virtual output queue from the internal ring in the Arista. We had problems there. We had output drops in this ring. It will not show up in Prometheus or something else, you will not get any counter unless you explicitly monitoring the inter internal ring. So if you have packet loss on a device, look if it will be very, very deep in the, in the hardware. And for Cisco, you have to show, you have to have a look at the locking simply because if something goes wrong by configuring, uh, you get an error message not on the configuration, but on the uh, only in the lock. Thank you. <laughs>